So we'll discuss today a little, about, a little bit about the question of organ transplants. And there's actually two parts to the question. There are many parts, but there are two parts of two types of organ transplants. There is after someone dies and signing the back of your license or what have you, donating your body, your organ after you pass on. That's one type of organ transplant. And they come with one set of issues. And the other one is donating an organ while you're alive, let's say a kidney. For, for In theory, you could live with one kidney, although it's better to have two. But mm-hmm. the question is, could you donate a lot? So we'll start with that question first. And We'll see how far we get. If we don't get to it today, we'll continue next week if we want. So regarding the first question of can one while they're living donate an organ? So what's the issue? Like, why wouldn't you be able to donate? So to donate two kidneys, so that would be suicide. So there's a biblical prohibition of committing suicide, so that's out. So we all know we have a mitzvah in the Torah Many mitzvahs, we have to take care of our health, take care of ourselves, and therefore we can't do anything to endanger ourselves. So therefore, not only can't we commit suicide, but even if I decide, you know, I only want nine fingers instead of ten, I'm not thinking of it, don't worry, but if I was, <laughs> then I would be, it'd be prohibited to cut off one of my fingers. That is, if you but if someone's born unfortunately with six fingers, so then what would you know? Then we it would be normal to cut off one to have five. But in general rule, you can't cause harm to yourself. You can't commit suicide. So the question is, when you're donating a kidney, that's the one we'll just use as an example. But I'm sure, and every other organ we talk about, we'll have to weigh the risk reward. But by donating a kidney, you are taking a certain risk. The risk being that your your other kidney fails, then you're in trouble. I guess unless someone else donates their kidney to you. But in general, there's a certain element of risk. And of course, that being said, the question today is a lot different than 50 years ago. Assuming they've been doing it 50 years ago. But obviously, technology is much better today. We whatever you know, whatever the percentages are, it's a lot better today to have a successful transplant from both people. Like, there's no point of donating a kidney if it's not gonna, it's gonna hurt you and it's not gonna help anyone else. But today with modern technology, much better. So we assume we could gauge the risk reward and we basically could figure out, I didn't look it up before, but whatever the percentages are, I assume it's, you know, could be a standard procedure these days in terms of transferring a, a kidney or again, an ordinary, surgery is dangerous as well. As the old joke goes, what's the difference between major surgery and minor surgery? When it's happening to you, it's minor. When it's happening to me, it's major. But besides that, there are some differences between major and minor surgery. So, of course, it's a, I'm sure any type of kidney transplant risk. So, again, you'll have to weigh, it's ultimately come down to the risk reward. But, so, the question, it's a more fundamental question, is is one allowed to risk one's own life to save someone else's life? In other words, someone we assume they're gonna die. If you don't, if they don't get a kidney transplant, both kidneys are failing, the person's gonna die. Again, anything could happen, you could have miracles, but based on the way things look, the person's gonna die. And you have the ability to give a kidney but, but that involves taking a major risk of your own life. Are you, is one, well, we're gonna, is one obligated to do it? Is it permissible or do you have to? Is it door number one, two, or three? Is one obligated to risk one's life to save someone else? B, if not, is, is it permissible? Or C, do I have to? So let's start off with A. Am I allowed to? Am I, it, Am I, you know, is, is, am I, is it permitted to? So, so we'll see from this. So it goes back to the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. That came before the Babylonian Talmud. 
And it says in the Jerusalem Talmud, they, they have the following case. Someone, this happens to be, we might as well go with real life, what happened, that's the case they give, but we could change the names and change the scenario, but Rev Emi, that was his name, Rev Emi, was taken captive. He was a great rabbi, and he was taken captive. And apparently, I guess there wasn't any ransom. There, there were, you know, they weren't asking for anything. I guess they're just going to kill him. So one rabbi said, Rav Yochanan said, let's bring out the tachrichim. Let's bring out the shrouds. You know, that's a very... What can we do? They're going to kill him. They're not asking for ransom. There's nothing we can do. What are we going to do? Hopefully they'll give us back the body and we'll bury him. That's what one rabbi said, Rav Yochanan. And Rav Shimon ben Lokish, another rabbi who, by the way, in his past was a bank robber. He was a Baal Tshuva. He repented and he became a great rabbi. So he said, I'm going to go down into my basement. I'll dust off that good old machine gun or whatever they had. And I'm going to go in and try to rescue Ravimi. Either we're both going to come out alive or we're both coming out dead. I am going in there and going after him. That, so that was the dispute in the Yerushalmi between Rav Yochanan and Rav Shimon ben Lokish. Whether Rav, so obviously the first opinion says you're clearly not obligated because he wasn't going in. And he, he viewed it, and Rav Shimon Lokish did go in. So people, so people quote the Yerushalmi that they say, we see from the Yerushalmi that one is obligated to go in, because they're assuming like Rav Shimon and Lokish, and therefore, what's the logic of the Jerusalem Talmud? Assuming that's correct, what is the logic that, if you assume you are obligated to go in, what's the logic? The logic is, to borrow a phrase in Dine Mamanos in monetary law, that let's say someone's holding on to the money. You have no witnesses, no documents, you have no idea whose it is. So as a general rule is, possession is nine-tenths of the law. That the burden, if, if I'm holding on to it, the burden of proof is on you. I'm holding on to this iPhone and but there's no proof of it. If I'm holding it, obviously someone saw you take it from the guy's hands or steal it, doesn't mean anything, but assuming barring any other evidence of the general rule is, I'm called a muksak. I'm called, it's, I have a chazaka. If I'm holding on to it, it's been in my house. The assumption is it's mine unless proven to the contrary. I don't have to prove it's not mine. I don't have to prove it's mine. You have to prove it's yours. So the burden of proof is on the one who wants to take something away. So, so Jerusalem Talmud says here, if we do nothing, the person's definitely going to die. And if I go in and try to save him, it's only a doubtful death. So therefore, the rule is, ain't suffic motzimidei vaday. A doubt doesn't be out of definite. And since I only have, it's only doubtful risking my life. So therefore, I am obligated to go in. So that's the Jerusalem Talmud, that one is obligated to risk one's own life to save this other person. However, the question is, do we follow this opinion? Because in general, the rule is, if there's a dispute between the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud, since the Babylonian Talmud came afterwards, we assume it incorporated everything it wanted to from the Jerusalem Talmud. And if there's a dispute between the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud, we go with the Babylonian Talmud because that was written after. However, it doesn't mean categorically we, re we reject the Jerusalem Talmud. If the Jerusalem Talmud says something and we have no contrary Babli, Babylonian Talmud, then we go with the Yushami. So. The Yushami says you have to risk, you're obligated to risk one's life to save someone else. So is there any Bavli that disagrees? So let's go check if we can find any, anything in the Talmud that would say one is not obligated to risk one's life. So there's one Gemara, it's a Gemara in Nida. 
The Gemara has the following case. I believe it's Rabbi Tarfon was the rabbi. And someone, these people came knocking on his door, ringing the bell, banging on his door. Quick, you have to save us. The Romans, whoever, the, the local government, the non-Jewish government, they're coming after to kill us. So we want you to hide us. So, Rabbi, I'll just paraphrase one way of warning the Talmud. So, Rabbi Tavrin said, no, I'm not going to take you in. So the question is, why wouldn't he take them in? In other words, there was a call, yes, there was a, so he said it like this. He says, because what's going to happen if they find out that you're hiding in my house and they know I'm harboring a criminal, they're going to kill me and my family also. So what do we see? Right, Tarifone felt he wasn't obligated to risk his life and his family's life to save someone else. Others want to say maybe that's not a foolproof because why? Because maybe in this case, because maybe they were really guilty, that maybe there was a there was a rumor that these people killed someone. So in other words, maybe Rabbi Tarfon thought, maybe in, in all things being equal, maybe if he felt they were innocent, maybe he would have saved them. But maybe he thought, he knew they were murderers and they deserved to be caught. Again, you know, so, so therefore some want to try to say the, the Gemara is not a proof, but that's how the Gemara seems to be. And I want to say, unless you assume it's talking about a case where they were guilty anyway. Another Gemara is about how far do we have to go to save someone's life? So there's a verse in the Bible, Losamod al dam reyecha. Don't stand by idly when your friend is in danger, when your friend is being killed. Don't stand by idly. That's one verse. So therefore, one is obligated to try to save someone's life. And there's another verse also in the Bible that it says you, it's talking about returning a lost object. If someone loses something and, and you know who it belongs to, you're obligated to return it. So the Talmud says, if someone loses their money, their scarf, their pants, their iPad, whatever, you're obligated to return it, how much more so returning someone's life? If someone's life is in danger and you can save it, how much more so you have, so we have two different verses to tell us that we have to save someone's life. So the Talmud says, why do we need two verses? So the Talmud says, because from one verse I would have known that if someone's drowning in the sea, I have to go in and save them. But how do I know? Let's say I don't know how to swim. So how do I know that if, that if I personally can't do it, but there's a lifeguard there, I have to pay the lifeguard to, to do it? Comes along the other verse, Vashi Vosolo. So we have two verses to teach me. One is that I, if I could personally do it, I'm obligated. And secondly, even if I personally can't do it, but if I have means for it to be facilitated, I am obligated as well. That's what the Talmud says. So comes along the commentators and says, the Talmud should have said something even more than that. It should have said, you know what? One, per, one verse tells me I have to, you know, if I have a boat and I want to throw out the life jacket or the life tube, so that I have an obligation to do it. But how do I know that I have an obligation to jump in the water or risk my own life to save someone else. But the fact that Talmud does not say that, so someone conclude that because the Bavli says you don't have to. The reason why the Gemara did not give that example is because the Babylonian Talmud disagrees and says one does not have to risk one's own life to, to, to throw in a tube, to throw in a, go on a boat and you know, do something non-risky, so then you're obligated to. But perhaps to have put, put myself at risk, so then from here we see perhaps that you don't have to. That's one other Gemara. One more is, there's a famous Gemara 
we are, they call the lifeboat ethics that basically you're stuck in the desert and you only have one bottle of water. And let's assume in the case is, and you only have enough water for one of you to get back to civilization. If you shared the water, then both of you wouldn't have enough water. So what do you do? Let's assume you have enough water for two days and it's a two day trip back to where you can get more water or other food. So do you keep the water or do you share it? So Ben Petira says, share the water. How could you sit around watching the death of someone else? You share the water and let the chips fall where they may. And Rabbi Akiva says that no, that I, I, Rabbi Akiva quotes a verse in the Bible in Leviticus, V'chei achicha imach, that the verse says that your life takes precedence over anyone else. And therefore you're obligated to keep the water for yourself because that's paramount to suicide. You're basically, you know, putting yourself to death by sharing the water. So it's a dispute in the Talmud between Rabbi Akiva and Ben Petira whether you share the water or whether you keep it for yourself. So the question is, which one makes more sense? I mean, Ben Petira makes a nice bumper sticker. It's a nice slogan. Better two deaths than one murder, or even though it's not a murder, but bottom line is, well, should two people die is better. If one person can live, why should they both die? What's the logic of Ben Petira? I, under, I understand the logic. We can agree or disagree, but I'm saying the logic of Ben Petira doesn't make any sense. Like they, the, I think it's um, one of the religions they talk about, but they're borrowing the phrase from is, in Judaism, if the fetus is endangering mommy, you have an obligation to abort the fetus and save the mother. There's no option here. You have to do it. In other religions, that you're not allowed to do an abortion, and therefore they say better because they assume life begins at conception, which we also believe it begins at conception, but we don't con not all life is equal. A fetus it doesn't equal a regular human being. So therefore they, they, they have a slogan, better two deaths than one murder. Let the fetus kill the, you know, let the fetus, leave the fetus and they'll both die. Better two deaths, meaning the fetus and mommy die, than one murder than kill the fetus. Uh, we also agree with that in principle, we just don't like the application. It's not murder, if you're killing the fetus to save the, it's not murder, you're doing a mitzvah, you're saving someone's life. So what's the logic of Ben Petira? It's a nice slogan, a nice bumper sticker, but it doesn't make any sense. No, so obviously you have to say as follows. Clearly the case is, it's not a definite death here. You have enough, let's say, in, you have enough water for two days. You know definitely if two days, or whatever the amount is, you'll be able to make it back to get more water. So if you don't share the water, you'll definitely be able to make it back and get more water. But right now the rescue team is out. That everyone's looking for you. It doesn't mean they're not gonna find you before. People, you might find some food, you might find some water somewhere. What Ben Petir is saying is, you can't commit suicide, he agrees to that. You can't just say share the water and both die. That makes no sense. What he's saying is share the water that you have to risk your own life to take a chance and hope that maybe you'll find some food or water before the two days are up. So Ben Petiri's opinion is that one is obligated to risk one's life to save your friend. Because if you don't get share the water with your friend, he'll definitely die. So they have a Ben Petiri says you have an obligation to risk one's life to save your friend. And Rabbi Akiva disagrees. Not Rabbi Akiva in principle agrees. He says, you're right, logically it makes sense. But what could I do? The Torah tells us your life takes precedence over everyone else's. And therefore, we follow Rabbi Akiva that one is not obligated to risk one's life. So we see basically from the Babylonian Talmud, there's a disagreement with the Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud says 
one is obligated to risk one's life to save someone else. And the Bavli says one is not obligated to risk one's life. So how do we follow? Which opinion do we follow? So as a general rule, we follow the Babylonian Talmud. And if that's true, then one would not be obligated to risk one's life to save someone else. So let me, however, not everyone agrees with this. I'll give you a, 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 the case is, again, I didn't, I'm not even getting to organ transplants. I'll get to that in a minute. I'm just talking about, let's say we're talking about an infectious disease is happening. And this is a real case. It, it was, um, I guess, a, when they used to have the breakout of core, it's such as it's, it's just like a CL. It was um, not uncommon then. I always forget the word. What type of um, contagious disease was around? SARS. And that's more recent. Oh. About like 100 years ago. Oh, oh. Um, more. Polio. But it doesn't make it. Whatever disease we want to make up, it really doesn't make a difference. I just, I just want to remember the name. But so there's an infectious disease going on. So Rav Chaim Salavechik, that's the. Uh, the grandfather of the Rav Salavechik from Boston, uh, ep, uh, infectious disease broke out. People were on the ground lying half dead and they were contagious. And he said one is obligated to go ahead and try to save, and save these people. Many people were saved. Other people who risked their life died from the contagious disease. So the, so the Salavechik family followed the Jerusalem Talmud that they felt the normative halach is you would not be obligated to risk one's life. The, but the Salvatians went with the Jerusalem Talmud and they said you are. However, that's a diff- the, the fact that you're obligated to risk your life in the case of the infectious disease does not mean that they'd say in the case of an organ transplant that one is obligated to give a kidney. I would assume no one would say you're obligated to give a kidney. That's something you're taking out. You know, here, it's a not, you know, like, here you, you're healthy, you're taking a risk, but once you get by, everything's gonna be fine. Here, you're taking out a kidney, that's something that's gonna be with you for the rest of your life. So, it doesn't necessarily follow. We assume you, you don't have to risk your life in a case of the infection. Again, if you're a doctor, if you're a health professional, that could be a different Shiloh. Maybe that's part of the rule, you know, like a fireman, obviously, like, does he have to go in when there's a fire? Well, I guess if he didn't, we'd be in trouble. So obviously, or a policeman, well, sorry, the guy has a gun in the house, I'm not going in. So obviously, or you have a, you have an, you have a, you have an army, well, sorry, we're not going to fight. So obviously, it's built in to certain professions, it's an element of danger, so that's a given, that's, so if you're in an army and you're fighting, and if you're in a policeman and that's your job, well, you know, a fireman, you know, whether you're getting more, you know, you, you know, you, you agreed to the job, you know, whether you're getting more money for it now, you know, whatever the case may be. So that's obviously something else. Obviously, there, obviously, I'm sure the rules within the police department, you know, not going in alone, doing things to protect yourself, but ultimately, being a police officer is going to involve the higher a higher risk, you know, unless you're sitting behind the desk, but a higher risk or a fireman than, let's say, sitting in an office. But, you know, built in, but, but so, let's say the average person on the street, so Rav Chaim said he was obligated to go ahead and risk his life to save. The norm of Allah, you wouldn't be obligated. And even Rav Chaim wouldn't necessarily say you're obligated to get an organ transplant, so an organ transplant, because that's taking it another step. You could to say you're obligated to help someone who has an infectious disease, but doesn't want to really follow that you're going to say, and therefore you're obligated to, you know, so I don't think anyone would say you're obligated because it's too much risk and an effect. Per, so you're probably, so, so you're not obligated to donate a kidney. So are you, are you allowed to? So that's a, right, so that's a discussion in the post, they talk about the famous case of the Radvaz, okay, one of the great rabbis, he was asked the following question. I guess it was the modern day question. Um, there was, you know, it was an anti-Semite, non-Jew, like tyrant, and he, 
he had another Jew and he said, you know what, I'm going to kill this guy. I'm going to kill your good friend, Yaakov. But you know what, I'm such a nice guy, I'll give you a way you can save him. If you cut off your ear, I'll let, I'll let your friend live. So the question is, are you obligated to cut off your ear to save, um, to save your friend or save your enemy, save the person? That was the question asked. To, you know, again, to keep in mind during those days, cutting off your ear was, a, you know, infections, this and that. It was, you're putting yourself in, in a real danger. So the, to the Radvaz right, a person who cuts off their ear is a chassid shota, a pious fool, that he said one, again, it's not a halachic saying you can't, He's saying is obviously you shouldn't, meaning obviously, again, you have to keep in mind what cutting the air off meant during that time. So but the bottom line is, there's a fine line between being a pious fool and doing something commendable. It's gonna come down to the risk reward. How much risk you take versus how much gain. So clearly, you're not obligated to donate an organ and risk your own life. Whether it's preferable would depend on the risk reward. You know, you have to go through how much you're putting yourself in risk versus the gain, etc. It doesn't have to be organ. It could be any question, infectious disease. You always have to weigh um, the risk reward. So we said you're not obligated. According to some, it might be permissible, and some might, might even say it's prohibited. That you're putting it's too much. You know, you're putting yourself. One is not allowed to put, it is prohibited to risk one's life. And so we have the whole gamut. We have from, from some saying is you're obligated to risk your life to save. One would say it's commendable and others would say it's prohibited. So again, so we, um, you know, so the norm, again, so the norm of Allah would depend on what the case is, but, you, but we clearly assume you're not obligated, let's say, let's say in an organ transplant, you know, in a case of infectious diseases as well, that would, you know, you're probably not obligated either. Again, assuming you're not in that position where that's your job to do it. Rav Chaim felt you are, but the normative most would assume that you wouldn't be obligated, but it wouldn't be, let's say, I'm just making up, but let's say it was only a 10% chance that you'd catch this disease. And you're not, you know, so then, according to many, then it might be commendable. So if it, you know, if it's a less than a 10% chance, so you always have to weigh. Um, so that's so up to now we're talking about one on one. You're risking one life to save another life. Would it make a difference if I'm risking one life to save many lives? And perhaps would it make a difference to risk one life to save all the Jewish people? Would that make a difference? So where do we have precedent that someone risked their life to save the Jewish people? Where do we find it? Do we find it? Esther. Very good. So Esther, basically, Mordechai basically told Esther that you basically have to go into a Hashveros and basically Going into Achazeros, meaning if you're not inv if you're not invited to the king, so if you show up and he's in a bad mood, he'll kill you. So basically, you're risking your life to go. So Mordechai told Esther to go to the king. So basically, Mordechai was. T so we see we knew Esther did it. So again, the fact that Esther did it, that maybe would mean that you're allowed to. It wouldn't necessarily mean you're obligated to. So let's go see. Would you be allowed or obligated to risk one's life to save someone else. So, so according to the Jerusalem Talmud, it wouldn't be an issue because they say you're obligated to risk your life to save one person, so therefore certainly many. But according to the way we assume, you're not obligated to risk your life for one other, would you, would you be obligated for others? So there's, a, there's an interesting uh, Meshach Chachma, one of the commentators on Chumash, 
he talks about the case of Moshe Rabbeinu. He said, what happened with Moshe? God told Moshe to go back to Egypt and, and save the Jewish people. So what did he say in the verse? He said, Moshe, don't worry, you can go back now. The people who want you dead are no longer alive. It was dust and Aviron and they really were alive, but they had leprosy, so they were considered dead. But the verse says that, don't worry, you could go back now. The people who want you dead aren't there anymore. So what are the implications? That if the people were alive, then Moshe would not have to risk his life to save the Jewish people. Or we have a Mishnah in Makkaj which says something similar. Imagine there's a concept of Are Miklat, city of refuge, where basically you kill someone unintentionally. So you go into, uh, it's called the city of refuge, and basically you safe, it's a safe harbor. You can't, people can't go in. The, one, the avenger of blood can't come and get you. You're safe in there. So the question is, like, is let's say, and let's say the case was Yoav, let's say the general of the army is in there, so he's safe, and now the Jewish people have to fight a war, and he's the only general around. So would he be allowed to go out now and 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 um, go at him? So the Mishnah writes that he would not be obligated to even even Yoav ben Suryu, who was the guy, would not be obligated. Doesn't say why. All it just says is Yoav ben Suryu would not be obligated to leave the city of refuge. So so the Meshachachma or Meir Simcha. Do you know why? Because we see from here you're not obligated to risk your life even to save the whole Jewish people. So that's, the, that's what he wants to be approved by motion here. However, we don't assume this way. Number one is, if you go back to the verse by Moshe, really already was decided beforehand. Moses already decided he was going back. Once he was going back already, God said, don't worry about it. But even if the guy... So if you read the Psukim, really it's not true. Moshe made the decision to go back even before he knew those people weren't there. So therefore, he would be willing to risk his life. And and why, oh, so why can't over here, why wouldn't you send the general out? To, not because he's not obligated to, not, not because in terms of, he's, not because he's not going to risk his life to save the Jewish people, but it's a special, they learned it out from a special verse in the Bible that, that, he, that, he, that he can't leave the Ari Mikla for any reason. In other words, let's say an interesting question would be is let's say this um, famous doctor committed murder and he was tried, now he's gonna be killed. So some say, wait a second, let's not kill the doctor. You know why? Because if you leave the doctor alive, he could save a thousand people. So would you say that you don't kill the doctor because that, it's clear the doctor deserves death. That's not quite, that's a given. So do I say save the doctor because so oh, we don't find that. We don't find that if the doctor deserves death, we don't find anywhere that you wouldn't kill him. So there's a special uh, verse we learn out that we don't, that. Uh, that that's why he didn't, Yoav wasn't obligated to go out. So the bottom line is, it goes like this. In terms of risking yourself one-on-one, -on -one, so we assume you're not obligated. However, let's say one in many, but not, so one in many, there's more room than, it's, it's more commendable than if you do, you might not be obligated, but it's certainly highly commendable because the Gemara talks about um, these two people who, let's say there was a town, let's say the, the, the non-Jews, the Gentiles surrounded the town and they said, you know what, we're going to destroy the whole town. But if you give us two people, let's say, let's assume the case was even, let's say they, there, there are two thieves in, in the town. Let's say there are a thousand Jews and there are two thieves. So what did the Gentiles say? 
either you give us back the two thieves or we're going to kill the whole town. So you let it give back the two thieves. So again, so if the so if the pill if if they if they name them and then the people and and it's true, everyone knows they did it. So then there's room to give them back. That's a, but let's say they name two random people again. They name two random people who are totally innocent. They say, give us Shlomo and Yaakov. So then you have no right to give over Shlomo and Yaakov, even though they say they're going to kill, because these people are innocent. You have no right to sacrifice them. However, if Shlomo and Yaakov volunteer, and they say, no, we want to go out, so then that seems to be praiseworthy. You can't force them out. But if they go out, there seems to be room that it's commendable to save the community. And we assume to save the Jewish people, one would be obligated. We see Moshe Rabbeinu did it, Esther, and, you know, because I guess it makes a lot of sense because if there's no more Jewish people, then what's the point? So therefore, one-on-one -on -one we assume you're not obligated. One for many... You're not necessarily obligated, but it's commendable. Again, in one and one, in all these, it depends on the risk-reward. In other words, to do a suicide mission is no point. In other words, that, it was a case, this is a real, um, unfortunately, it's a real-life case, where let's say someone, someone was taken captive. Let's say they, you know, the, this is the specific case was as follows. They were camping out in Lebanon, I guess. And they were camping out in Lebanon. And they were told specifically stay in this certain area. However, for whatever reason, these two soldiers, or one, they decided they want to go swimming. It was a hot day. They went swimming in the water and they got caught. So there's a whole question, you know, would you be obligated to go out and saved them because number one, it was their own fault. They put themselves in their own danger. And then there's a further discussion. Um, are they allowed to take the suicide pill? I think, you know, going back, um, you know, let's say a soldier's, because normally suicide is prohibited. But what about if you're concerned you're going to be tortured and then you're going to give away all the secrets? Let's say, for instance, you know secrets that could put Israel, the state of Israel, in jeopardy. So you're permitted to take a suicide pill before they get to you because you're concerned if they torture you. So that's a whole, you know, so that's a whole discussion. So they want to say, we know, um, show Hamelech. Well, you know, was it, we committed suicide. Get the, you know, depending on which version in Shmuel you look at. And, but we, but. He, he committed suicide, but we assume uh, normally suicide is looked upon as a terrible thing. In the case of Shaul, it was looked upon as a positive thing according to most commentators. So I, why was it positive? So number one, he, he was the king, so maybe it would have been a desecration of God's name. They would have dragged him across outside. But the best answer I like is because they're actually saving lives because Shaul knew that if he was alive, that many Jews are going to go and try to save, save him, and 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 he was surrounded by a superior army. They, all these people are going to be killed. So actually, by killing himself, he actually saved thousands of lives. So that's why he's permitted. If, if that is the logic behind why Shaul was permitted and commendable, so then in this case as well. If you're going to put the state of Israel in jeopardy, the Jewish millions of people, so then in that case you would be permitted um, to, you know, perhaps to take um, to take the suicide pill as well. But you know, so therefore, again, so what, you know, whether you're, you know, whether you're obligated to is another story. But if you know, if we assume there's a case of saving, you know, saving the Jewish people, I mean, it's not the whole Jewish people because you still have more Jews out of Israel, but it's definitely a big chunk and, and therefore it would definitely be, you know, one of those things where is um, either commendable or, you know, perhaps, you know, per, you know, perhaps obligated depending on, 
you know, probably, you know, probably um, it's hard to make it obligated, it's hard to force them. If he doesn't want to take it, he's not going to do it. But in, but in terms of that's dealing, that's dealing with the many. So there's a, so that's what it comes down to. It comes down to, obviously, because why do we have this one versus the many? Because there are three things you cannot, the, normally the halach is better to violate the sin and stay alive. So in other words, if you have a Shabbos emergency, better to desecrate the Shabbos and get better, go to the hospital, call the ambulance, whatever you have to do, because better to desecrate one Shabbos so you can keep many more. And better to eat non-kosher one time and still be alive then, you know, then be dead. So that's what we assume. However, for the big three, for the three Averis of not committing adultery, not to worship idols, and not to murder someone else, we assume there's a mitzvah to sanctify God's name. So what is the reason why I can't kill you to save my life? The reason is because the expression of the Talmud is, who says your blood is redder than mine? In other words, who am I to say my life is more valuable than yours? No one to say their life is more valuable than someone else. Who knows? So therefore, you, you never have a right to kill someone else to save your own life because maybe his life is worth more than yours. What? Your first duty is to yourself. Yeah, so you're, yeah but you're not going to murder someone. That's one of the... Yeah, so have your first duty is... So therefore, you should eat the non-kosher, desecrate the Shabbos. But murdering someone else, you know, I got to murder someone else. Who says you are alive? Save yourself. Even to save yourself. That being said, if you did, you wouldn't be necessarily, if you gave out, if you gave into pressure under duress, you wouldn't be labeled a murderer per se, but you definitely did the wrong thing. You'd be obligated to give up your own life. Those are one of the three cases. Normally, your life does take precedence, except for the big three. It doesn't. However, the question is, what, unfortunately, this is a real case also uh, during Nazi Germany, but it could happen any time. Let's say the Nazi soldiers used to rape the Jewish women, and then sometimes they got pregnant. So not only was it, it was if the Nazi got caught, that he got in trouble also. So what many times the Nazi, he wouldn't go to a, a German doctor because he was afraid the German doctor would report him. So he used to go to a Jewish doctor, you know, perhaps even one in the ghetto in the camps and say, either do the abortion or I'll kill you. So what's the halacha? Someone puts a gun to your head, you're a doctor, and they say abort or I will kill you. So the halacha is, you can do the abortion. Because why? Because what's the reason you know we can't kill someone else to save your life? Because who says your blood is redder than someone else's? Because we know in Judaism a human life is more important than a fetus. So therefore you're allowed to kill, it's like with a fetus and a mother, so you're allowed to kill a fetus to save your own life. So similarly, that's the question. Could I also make that argument to, to, to give my own life to save a hundred people, or to save a thousand people, or to save Christ? So then there's room to ready to discuss the question and it depends, you know, how many people, you know, it could be a numbers game, how many. And also, it all comes back to, as well, um, the risk-reward, how much risk you have to take versus what the potential gain is.